Welcome to this powerful session on sample size calculation with Easy Physiology and Research Pro, a cornerstone of scientific research design that too many overlook or oversimplify. Today, we are diving into the age-old misconception that bigger is always better. While large sample sizes may seem appealing, especially in the age of big data, they do not automatically translate into better science. In fact, oversampling can introduce ethical dilemmas, inflate costs, and even increase statistical errors. Instead of defaulting to size, we need to aim for precision, for that optimal balance between validity, feasibility, and ethics. In the next 19 slides, we'll uncover the scientific rationale, the key formulas, and the practical wisdom needed to strike that balance. Because in research, more is not always smarter. It is just more. Let's clarify what you'll walk away with. First, you will understand the critical factors that govern sample size, such as effect size, statistical power, and variability. Second, we'll walk through essential formulas for calculating sample size across different study types, from clinical trials to observational and qualitative research. And finally, you'll see why oversampling, though tempting, can be counterproductive. Whether you're planning your first study or refining a grant proposal, this session will give you the statistical backbone to make your sample size work for your research, not against it. Statistical power is the probability that your study will correctly reject the null hypothesis when a true effect exists. Simply put, it's your study's ability to detect the truth. Power is influenced by your sample size, the magnitude of the effect, and the significance level you set. A typical threshold is 80 to 90 percent, which gives you a solid chance of capturing a true relationship if it exists. This is directly tied to type 2 error, or beta, the probability of missing a real effect. The complement of this, 1 minus beta, is your power. High power reduces the risk of false negatives. But here's the kicker. Pushing for very high power without good reason can balloon your sample unnecessarily. It's about balance, not brute force. Five primary elements dictate how large or small your sample should be. First, effect size. The bigger the effect you expect, the smaller the sample you need. Second, power. Aiming for higher power increases your sample size but improves your chances of detecting real effects. Third, alpha, or the significance level, usually set at 0.05. Tighter thresholds like 0.01 demand larger samples. Fourth, variability. Greater standard deviation or spread in your data inflates the sample size needed to achieve precision. And finally, study design. Crossover studies may need fewer participants than parallel arm studies. Add dropouts, stratification or clustering, and your sample size needs recalibration. Understanding these variables isn't just statistics, it's scientific strategy. If you're comparing the means of two groups, say treatment versus placebo, this formula is your go-to. It's based on detecting a difference between two population means using the standard deviation and the critical values from the normal distribution for alpha and beta. The formula is sample size is two times the variance multiplied by the square of the sum of z values for alpha and beta, divided by the square of the difference in means. In simpler terms, greater variance or smaller expected differences means you need more participants. This is crucial in clinical trials where small improvements matter, like in lowering blood pressure or cholesterol. Planning a trial without this formula is like driving blindfolded, risky and expensive. Let's now look at proportions. This formula is essential when you're comparing two groups based on percentages, like disease prevalence between vaccinated and unvaccinated groups. It adjusts for pooled variance from both groups and their expected proportions. When the expected difference between groups is small, the required sample size rises sharply. For example, testing a new vaccine with 5% improvement over the current standard, you'll need hundreds maybe thousands of participants, depending on your desired power and significance. It's a robust yet demanding framework for making population level decisions. When your goal is to estimate a population mean, say, the average fasting glucose level, 
you'll use a simpler formula. Here, sample size is based on the population's standard deviation, the critical value of Z, and your desired margin of error. Want tighter confidence intervals? Then be ready for a larger sample. This formula is a favorite in nutrition, physiology, and pharmacology studies where averages speak volumes. It's also frequently used in pilot studies to lay the groundwork for larger trials. This formula helps you estimate how common something is. For instance, what proportion of people have hypertension in a city? You'll need an estimate of the proportion, your desired precision, and confidence level. The tighter your desired interval or the closer the proportion is to 0.5, the bigger your sample will need to be. This is a go-to for public health surveillance and community-based screening programs. But beware, incorrect assumptions about prevalence can either underpower or unnecessarily inflate your sample. These study types are the bread and butter of epidemiology. For cohort studies, sample size depends on the relative risk and exposure prevalence. The formula is robust but requires thoughtful inputs. For case control studies, we calculate based on odds ratios and the proportion of controls exposed. Matching ratios like 1-2 or 1-4 can improve efficiency. These calculations are less straightforward and usually require software, but they're essential in designing cost-effective and statistically sound observational research. When your study population is small, sampling more than 5% of it risks overrepresentation. That's where finite population correction, or FPC, comes in. It adjusts the required sample size downward, preventing waste and ethical burden. The formula is simple but powerful. Adjusted n equals unadjusted n divided by 1 plus n minus 1 over total population. If you're studying students in one school, a remote village, or a closed registry, FPC isn't optional, it's essential. Effect size is the heartbeat of sample size calculation. It tells you how big a difference you expect to see between groups. Cohen's D gives you a standard 0.2 is small 0.5 is medium 0.8 is large. Here's the trick. The smaller the expected effect, the larger your sample size must be to detect it. That's because subtle changes are harder to distinguish from random noise. Imagine detecting a 1 mm change in tumor size. It needs way more participants than identifying a 5 mm reduction. Many researchers overestimate their effect size and end up underpowered. Always base your effect size on prior evidence, meta-analyses, or pilot data because this is the variable that makes or breaks your study design. Oversampling might feel safe, but in research, overdoing it introduces risk, not rigor. First, cost. More participants means more tests, more time, more manpower. Second, statistical distortion. Larger samples can pick up minuscule, clinically irrelevant effects and still report statistical significance. You might declare victory over a placebo when the actual benefit is marginal at best. Third, ethical issues. Why recruit and burden more participants than necessary? In clinical trials especially, every blood draw, every visit has a human cost. Bigger can mean wasteful, misleading, and unethical. Smart research demands just enough, not as much as possible. Let's get real. Ethics committees and institutional review boards, IRBs, don't just care about what you want to study, but how you plan to do it. Sample size justification isn't a formality. It's about safeguarding participants from needless procedures and ensuring that research resources are used responsibly. An overinflated sample can cause delays, drain funds, and expose more people to risk without scientific merit. If your funding is limited, oversampling may reduce the quality of your follow-up. Worse, it increases your risk of type 1 errors when analyzing multiple subgroups. The logistics of participant management are equally critical. Recruitment, retention, data quality, all scale with sample size. Bigger studies demand bigger systems. Are you ready? Qualitative research laughs in the face of standard formulas. Here, sample size is not predefined by math, but by data saturation the point at which new interviews or observations no longer yield novel insights. 
different designs call for different norms. Phenomenology may require 5 to 25 participants. Grounded theory might need 20 to 30 interviews. Ethnography could involve 30 to 50 observations. It's iterative and flexible. You collect data, analyze in real time, and decide when to stop. That's why rigor in qualitative research depends not on quantity, but depth, diversity, and theoretical completeness. You don't stop when you hit 30 participants. You stop when your concepts are saturated and your theory is robust. In longitudinal studies, people leave. They relocate, lose interest, or fall sick. That's attrition. And ignoring it means setting yourself up for underpowered results. Fortunately, the fix is simple. N adjusted is equal to N by one minus dropout rate. Expecting a 20% dropout? Divide your initial sample by 0.8. This buffer ensures that even after losing participants, your study retains enough power. This is critical in trials, follow-ups, and behavioral studies where long-term engagement is tricky. Remember, planning for dropouts is not pessimism. It's professionalism. You don't need to be a statistician to calculate sample size, but you do need the right tools. Here are four gold standard options. One, open epi, free, web-based, great for epidemiological studies, includes FPC. Two, G-Power, the most comprehensive power analysis tool, ideal for t-tests, ANOVAs, regressions. Three, Rayosoft, Tailored for surveys, lets you input confidence level and response distribution. 4. Qualtrics? Perfect for social sciences with built-in dropout adjustment and user-friendly interface. Each tool has a niche. Pick based on study design, effect size, and whether you're expecting dropouts or small population constraints. And remember, no calculator can fix bad assumptions. Garbage in, garbage out. Let's break it down with a real example. A research team planned a two-group study. Based on power analysis, they needed 85 participants per group to detect a meaningful 15% difference. But erring on the side of caution, they recruited 200 per group. The outcome? No extra benefit, no added insights, just inflated data and an extra $45,000 spent. That's salary, lab supplies, logistics, and time all gone. Worse, it may have overcomplicated analysis and interpretation. This case isn't rare. It's a cautionary tale. Bigger without justification is not safer. It's wasteful. Let's recap the essentials. Optimal sample size ensures scientific validity, not maximal. Understand assumptions. Effect size, variability, power, and study design. Avoid overkill ethically, financially, and statistically. Use tools, but use them wisely. Document everything, especially for IRBs and grants. Because sample size is not just a statistical exercise. It's a scientific decision that reflects your clarity of purpose, understanding of methodology, and commitment to quality research. Curious to explore more? Check out the following gold standard guidelines. Consort, for clinical trials, STROBE, for observational studies, NIH guidance, for sample size justification, core references, one, Luanga and Lemeshow's WHO sample size manual, two, Hulley et al's designing clinical research, three, the G Power software manual. These are not just footnotes. They're your roadmap to becoming a methodologically solid researcher. Read them, understand them, apply them, and congratulations. You've just mastered the hidden backbone of good research, optimal sample size. This is where theory meets reality, where statistics guard ethics, and where science truly becomes meaningful. Like, share, and subscribe to Easy Physiology and Research Pro because this is where the future of medical research is being built, one smart sample at a time.